hands for Mary Lee and Paul. Hello, members of AHEAD. Good morning. Good morning. I'm deaf blind. I have limited vision and hearing. Public speaking is easy when you can't see the audience. <laughs> I do want to connect with people. So all throughout my life, I've been looking for strategies to help best to connect with people if you have limited vision and hearing. And here's a solution I've come up with. I'm holding up a Braille computer. There are dots on the bottom. I run my fingers over the dots to feel the letters. Digital Braille. This is connected through Bluetooth to a keyboard. And we have an interpreter on stage typing on a wireless keyboard. What she types comes up on the Braille computer. So she's giving me visual audio details from the audience. When people nod, laugh, fall asleep, <laughs> she's watching you. <laughs> My name is Haven. The name Haven comes from Eritrea. It's a small African country. Ethiopia borders to the south and to the north is the Red Sea. My mother grew up during the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. There was a lot of violence, a lot of fear. Students who came to school would hear about stories from countries and places all over the world. Stories are powerful. Stories influence the organizations we design, the products we build, and the futures we imagine for ourselves. At school, she heard stories, America's the land of opportunity, America's the land of civil rights. Those stories inspired her to take the dangerous journey, walking from Eritrea to Sudan. She was a refugee for about 10 months in Sudan. Then a refugee organization helped her come to the United States. Several years later, older, wiser, my mother realized it's not geography that creates justice. It's people that create justice. Communities create justice. All of us face the choice to accept unfairness or advocate for justice. As the daughter of refugees, a black woman, disabled, lots of stories say my life doesn't matter. I choose to resist those stories. I create my own stories. I define what disability means to me. The dominant culture defines disability as a burden on society. I define disability as an opportunity for innovation. If you face a challenge, it's an opportunity to come up with a new solution. I can't see the audience. I still want to connect with the audience. So I came up with an alternative solution to still get audience feedback. Disability is an opportunity for innovation. And if we can shift how our culture sees disability, we can have more people going to our schools and contributing in our classrooms, working as teachers and professors themselves. And our culture will be richer if we see disability as an opportunity for innovation. There are lots of people who believe this and practice this. People with disabilities have been innovating throughout our history, but very few people know it. So we need to get these stories out there. Next slide. We have a video that shows sign language. Sign language is actually a form of innovation. If you cannot hear language, you can create a visual language. Sign language is a visual language. The dominant one in the US is American Sign Language. Across the pond in France, they have, um, in France they have French Sign Language, 
And the, in the UK, they have a completely different language that makes no sense to me. <laughs> they call it British Sign Language. In the video, a young man is signing. I have my hands over his hands, feeling his signs. That's called tactile sign language. Deaf-blind communities have also been developing different ways to communicate. Sign language, tactile sign language, is one way to communicate. And there are many more. If you find yourself facing a solution, if you find yourself facing a challenge, come up with a solution. And schools shouldn't be places where people innovate new solutions. They're a great opportunity, especially schools with great engineering programs who can come up with new technologies that'll end up being the next big thing. Next slide. Another form of communication is dance. In dances like salsa, people communicate rhythm, music, feet, through their bodies, hands, shoulders. Originally, schools asked me to step out of programs like dancing because people assumed it wouldn't be done. How would a deaf-blind student dance? Then in middle school, I went to a camp. And at the camp, they had a dance instructor, a blind dance instructor. She showed me that I can access dance through my hands, and she showed me physically the steps for salsa. And since then, I've been taking lessons. When I dance, I can't see the other dancers or hear the beat of the music. I'm following through the hands of the people I'm dancing with. Skin is our largest organ. Haptics is the communication of information through touch. There's a lot of potential of new ways of communicating, new technologies, if we explore the connections between haptics, touch, and all other aspects of our life, especially technology. There are many things we can develop here. And blind people and other people with disabilities who develop these skills, tactile intelligence, can help lead the way in haptics and innovation. Inclusion happens when communities choose to remove barriers. If you don't do anything, your program or service is not going to be accessible. You have to take steps to remove the barriers to make it accessible. And teachers throughout my life, I've had great ones and not so great ones. One of my favorites, she came up to me one day and asked, would you like to learn surfing? And I thought to myself, how on earth would I go surfing? <laughs> but I told her, sure, let's give it a try. <laughs> she introduced me to a program called Ride a, Wave, Ride a Wave that takes students with disabilities surfing. Next slide. We have a video where I'm surfing on a tandem board. It's a large board. The water guide is in the back. I'm in front of the water guide on the surfboard. And the water guide is steering around other surfers and sharks. <laughs> I loved the experience. I enjoyed feeling the ocean through the surfboard. You could feel a lot of the vibrations. I loved feeling the water, the sun. I wanted to not just ride waves, but learn to be a surfer and take lessons. That specific program did not do surf lessons. So I reached out to schools asking, can I take lessons with you? And the schools told me, We've never heard of a deaf-blind surfer. <laughs> then, wait, why are you laughing? <laughs> then one school told me, we've never heard of a deaf-blind surfer, but let's try. Let's find a way. And we had a lesson. Next slide. 
In this lesson, we're surfing side by side. And that allows me to experience riding on my own surfboard, learning to stand up and balance on my own. And the instructor is right next to me, so he can help steer around other surfers and sharks. <laughs> there are a lot of programs at schools. Schools have more students with disabilities now than ever before. That's great, but access does not end at the university gate. You need to make all programs accessible, even the surfing classes, even the labs and science programs. We really need to continue removing barriers at schools, and it's not enough to just admit students with disabilities. You have to look around the campus, identify barriers. Some of them are just assumptions, assuming, oh, we've never heard of someone with that disability doing this program. That's an opportunity to be a pioneer. Take up that opportunity, remove barriers. I went to a college that celebrated the pioneering spirit. The college was called Lewis and Clark College. Their football team was called the Pioneers. Their newspaper is the Pioneer Log. Their shuttle is called the Pioneer Express. <laughs> the shuttle takes you to Pioneer Square. <laughs> they really loved their Pioneers. <laughs> Lewis and Clark had a cafeteria where students would relax and hang out between classes. When you walk in, Along three of the walls are large windows showcasing Portland's rain. <laughs> Along the fourth wall were food stations. And sighted students would walk in, browse a print menu, then go to their station of choice. I couldn't read the print menu. Blindness wasn't the problem. Disability is never the problem. The problem was the format of the menu. So I went to the cafeteria manager and explained, I can't access the menu because of the format of the menu. Would you provide it in Braille or post it online so that all students can access it? Or we can email it to me. I have assistive technology that allows me to use email. The manager said, we're very busy. Stop complaining and be more appreciative. If there's chocolate cake at station four and no one tells me, <laughs> I'm not feeling appreciative. <laughs> Back then, I was a vegetarian. It's hard to eat vegetarian if you don't know what the food choices are. I would choose station at random, get food, find a table, try the food, and discover an unpleasant surprise. It was really frustrating. For the first few months, I just tolerated the situation. I told myself, at least I have food. Lots of people around the world struggle for food. Who am I to complain? My mother, when she was my age, was a refugee in Sudan. At least I was getting an education at a college. A lot of schools do not provide Braille materials to blind students. And that forces the blind students to fall behind in their courses. Lewis and Clark was doing a fantastic job giving me all my course materials in Braille. I was doing well in my classes. The only problem was the cafeteria. Maybe the manager was right. Maybe I should just be grateful and stop complaining. A lot of us encounter barriers that could be considered small. And we ask ourselves, do we just put up with it? I talked to my friends, and they reminded me, it's my choice. It's our choice to accept in fairness or advocate for justice. Yes, there are lots of barriers. If you take the time to address a small barrier, you allow yourself the opportunity to build up the skills to tackle the larger obstacles. As a college student, I realized that if I wanted our world to be more inclusive, I had to do something about it. 
and starting out with the small barriers is a great practice. So I talked to advocates, I did research, and I went back to the cafeteria manager, and I told that guy, the Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against students with disabilities. <laughs> If you don't provide access, I'm going to sue. <laughs> I had no idea how I would do that. I was 19. I couldn't afford a lawyer. But I knew I had to try something. The next day, the manager apologized and promised to make the menus accessible. They kept their word. They started providing access to the menus. Life became delicious. <laughs> the next year, a new blind student came to the college. He didn't have to fight for access to the menus. He had immediate access. And that taught me that when I remove a barrier, it's not just me. It benefits the entire community. I was inspired to become an advocate and go to law school and develop the skills to advocate for our entire community. I started at Harvard Law School in 2010. Harvard told me we've never had a deaf-blind student before. I told Harvard I've never been to Harvard Law School before. <laughs> we didn't know what the solutions would be but we engaged in an interactive process to find out those solutions. You're going to find students who are challenging your school to think in new ways. Don't resist the opportunity to become pioneers. Learn with the students. Your understanding of your subjects, science, math, surfing, will deepen when you engage with disabilities. I graduated from law school in 2013. Next slide. We have a photo from graduation. Dean Minow is handing me my diploma. Dean Minow and I are wearing academic regalia, and my guide dog is wearing a fancy fur coat. <laughs> what I just did is called image description. Image description provides access for blind individuals. When you post photos online, your websites, apps, make sure those photos are accessible. Having text image descriptions also increased, increases the text associated with your content, which helps with search engine optimization. A little history about Harvard. Throughout its history, Harvard excluded women for a significant part of its history. Helen Keller was a brilliant, amazing, deaf-blind woman who wanted to go to Harvard. But Harvard wouldn't admit her because she was a woman. Her disability didn't hold her back. Her gender didn't hold her back. It was the community at Harvard that decided women did not have the ability to study there. Over time, Harvard got a little smarter. And they finally opened their doors to women, people of color, and people with disabilities. I'm the first deaf-blind student at Harvard Law School, not because I am the smartest or most hardworking. Maybe I am. I don't know. <laughs> but because the school has finally removed enough barriers, and society as a whole has finally removed enough barriers, to allow more students with disabilities to share their talents and contribute at schools, and then move on to share their talents with the greater community. You all know inclusion is important. You value inclusion. But sometimes you encounter stubborn people who refuse to make accommodations. Next slide. This slide offers tips that you can share with individuals who resist your attempts to teach them to be more inclusive. The first argument is you reach more people when you choose inclusion. 
There are over 57 million Americans with disabilities and 1.3 billion people with disabilities around the world. That's not just students, but it's also potential professors, administrators, family members of your students and professors. So when you break down barriers at the school, you open yourself to more opportunities and learning with more talented individuals. Another one is reach, content discoverability, increased content discoverability. When you make your digital content accessible, more individuals will find your content, both disabled and non-disabled. That includes image descriptions, that includes captions for videos. When you caption your videos, more text is associated with your video, which means more people will find it through search engine optimization. Another one is innovation. Disability drives innovation. There are lots of stories of disability driving innovation. I've shared some of them. I'll share one more. Vince Cerf is one of the fathers of the internet. He's deaf, hard of hearing. Before the internet existed as we know it today, deaf people struggled to communicate long distance. Vince Cerf developed the earliest email protocol. Email is a way for people to communicate long distance without having to strain over the phone. Hearing people also use email. Lots of people use email. So when you take a disability challenge and design for it, you will build the next big thing that benefits our entire community. So here are some great arguments. You reach more people, you drive innovation, and you increase the discoverability of your content. If the stubborn person is still not convinced, tell them about legal requirements. Schools are required to make their services accessible to students with disabilities. That includes all aspects of the school. And we need to do the work of removing barriers. Litigation is expensive and time consuming. Choose inclusion. I've talked about digital accessibility. I'm going to share a short video that shows what digital accessibility looks like. Next slide. So when I'm using my phone, I use VoiceOver. VoiceOver can speak out loud and send information to the digital rail display. News. Checking for new news. National Geographic, on red. World's largest rodents on lamb from Toronto Zoo. I'm panning right on the rail display using the advanced forward button. If I wanted to instead use hand gestures on the iPhone, I could flick right with one finger. To open an item, I can double tap anywhere on the screen. Text size, caption, title, we title, world's large title. After escaping from the High Park Zoo in Canada, two capybaras have eluded catcher for by Jason Biddle. Published June 9. Most people do their best to avoid rodents of unusual size. But after a pair of capybaras escaped from Toronto's High Park Zoo on May alert, Gordon. Hi, I'm at the door sushi, pot of food, fish cake with swirl design. I'm just gonna let him know. Close. Button. Reply. Button. Messages notification. Hang. In. There. I'm. Almost. Done. With. This. Demo. Send. Button. VoiceOver has allowed me to access more information, news, mail, and messages. And it's also a way for me to know when friends are at the door. So that's an example of an app that's accessible. It's not a separate app for people with disabilities. It's the mainstream news app. Separate is never equal. We don't want separate schools. We want one school, one program, that everyone can attend.
thank you for the applause. <laughs> there are various aspects of digital accessibility. Screen, screen reader compatibility is one. The voice that was speaking on the app is called a screen reader. And there are different ones on different platforms. Windows, Mac, Android. Captions is another part of accessibility. When you have videos, add captions. It also benefits hearing students. Sometimes there are situations where the audio is not clear or there's English language learners. So captions benefit the entire community. Then there's support for assistive devices like switch control. Switch control helps individuals with limited mobility. Switch control allows one to operate your computer, tablet, smartphone using one switch. These are some of the things that exist. Keep innovating. Schools are great places to come up with new solutions, especially with engineering programs. And several schools have done that. They've created engineering classes that ask students find a disability-related problem and design for it. It's a great way to come up with new devices that benefit everyone. The main thing is don't make assumptions about what people with disabilities can or can't do. Design for every aspect of the school's programs to be accessible. Several years ago, I went to China for the first time. It's a long flight to Beijing. So I, when I got there, I went straight to my hotel room. There was something strange in my room. I picked up an object. I was holding it in my hand, trying to figure out what it was. It almost felt like a piece of fruit. I asked myself, hmm, should I taste it? I was really curious to figure out what it was, but not curious enough to bite into an unknown object. <laughs> so instead, I took a picture with my phone and texted it to a friend, asking, what is this? Is it safe to eat? <laughs> Next slide. It was dragon fruit. And I realized I like dragon fruit. A lot of people would assume, oh, there's no point in making a camera accessible. Blind people would never use cameras. But we do. There are lots of visual things in the world that we do use. Don't make assumptions about what students with disabilities, faculty with disabilities can or can't do. Design for everything to be accessible, all aspects of the university. Next slide. Take these lessons and share them with your community. Let's have everyone become an advocate for inclusion. Increasing hiring of people with disabilities will also help in that process. Students with disabilities need role models on campus. It would be amazing to have more professors and, administ and administrators with disabilities on campus. Next. Next slide. We have a photo where President Obama is standing at a table and typing on a keyboard. I'm on the other side of the table reading from a digital braille computer. When I met President Obama, we explained that I'm deafblind and access information best through touch. He usually communicates by voice, but he graciously switched from voicing to typing so I could access his words. Inclusion is a choice. When you choose inclusion, you role model inclusion for your whole community, inspiring more people to remove barriers and create a more inclusive world. Next slide. We're going to move on to q and I'm going to invite people to come up on stage, type your question, and I'll read it and voice back an answer. Don't be nervous about the keyboard. 
President Obama was able to tape on the keyboard. <laughs> so if we could have people come up and line up, that'd be amazing. If you're shy, you could also message me a question through social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. My handle is at Hobbin Grimma, and my website is hobbingrimma.com. One last thing. Over the past few years, I've worked really hard on writing a book. The book is full of fun, enjoyable, hilarious stories. Humor is a way to connect with people and convince people to come on board and advocate for inclusion. The book is called Hobbit, the Deaf Blind Woman Who Conquered Harvard Law. And it comes out next month. Pre-order it and help support the book. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Has anyone come up? Excellent. Any questions? And what's your name? Liz, Liz Thompson. I've been practicing audio description. I'm wondering how you approach audio description and race and skin color. Thank you. Good question. So race matters, and I want to get as many details as possible, especially as a diversity advocate. I want to know if photos of schools and universities have all white male students, or is it a diverse school? So included? Respectfully, kindly. I would remind folks here, add ahead, to do image descriptions. Thanks, Liz. It's Rick. <laughs> it's Rick Gambash from UC Santa Cruz. Good to see you, Rick. I spoke at UC Santa Cruz a few years ago. I follow you on Facebook. And suggest other folks do too. <laughs> I was wondering if you have good tips for accessibility on social media. One of the biggest problems is people posting photos without image descriptions. Even disability organizations, they keep posting photos, flyers for events without image descriptions. Then the other one is videos without captions. Caption your videos and also include a transcript. It's helpful. Transcripts are helpful for deaf and deafblind individuals, but they're also helpful for researchers, journalists who want to do research. Thanks, Rick. Hi, Haven. My 
name is Dorian. And I work at Harvard. <laughs> Why are they all laughing? <laughs> I would like to know your thoughts about people who are afraid to disclose about their disability. So the fear to disclose comes from personal experiences of being harassed for disclosing, of being discriminated against, and schools can help students feel safe to disclose by taking steps to create a safe and inclusive environment. So if you can convince the students that they're not gonna be discriminated against, they're more likely to disclose and request the accommodations they need. Thank you. Hello, my name is Wesley. I'm a graduate student at the University of Central Florida, an aspiring teacher. How do you recommend teachers identify the barriers that are in their class and not reply and not rely on assumptions they may have a lot of people have internalized ableism ableism is such a big part of our culture that a lot of us even people with disabilities even advocates internalize it so there will always be some assumptions but on a regular basis at the start of each school year, take a survey of the school and classroom. Bring in disability experts to help lead the survey and identify barriers and work to remove them. Bringing organizations with of people with disabilities can help catch a lot of the assumptions. Thank you. Hi, Haben. It's Kelly from AI Media, a captioning company. Good to meet you, Kelly. Nice to meet you. This is my first event here. and I'm a newcomer in disability. I want to understand how you learn to speak. There are lots of different forms of deafness. The deaf community is very diverse. I, I have a hearing loss that's based on low frequency so I have little to no low frequency hearing, but I have a little bit of high frequency hearing. And I learned to speak in a higher voice so I could hear some of the speech sounds. So part of it is the type of hearing loss I have. The other part is teachers and voice coaches helping me on pronunciation, projection, presence, lots and lots of practice. Wow, you are so inspiring. If you feel inspired, if other people here feel inspired, allow that emotion to drive action. 
Think about one thing you can do to make your communities more accessible. One thing you can do right now, not tomorrow, but in the immediate presence to take steps to make the community more accessible. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, and what's your name? My name is Ed from Tennessee Tech University. You mentioned several technologies. I'm wondering if you might be able to recommend a, a particular technology you have found helpful. So my needs are very unique. Every student with disability has, has specific unique needs. Some people might prefer using a Mac. Some people might prefer using a Windows. So it's, I think it's really important to give students with disabilities as many choices and tools as possible. Probably the one device that's really opened opportunities for me is the Braille computer. It's made communication and connecting with people much easier. Most people don't know sign language, but most people can type. So it's an easy way to immediately start talking to people. Great, thank you. Thanks, Ed. Hi, Haben. It's me. Who's me? Hugo. <laughs> Hugo Torito. We studied abroad together with Mobility International USA. I remember long time we did a, a program to Costa Rica working on disability rights and inclusion in Costa Rica. How are you doing, Hugo? Good. It's an honor to be the last person <laughs> to ask a question. Make it a good one. <laughs> the pressure is on. <laughs> I worry that ableism is so strong. That even the educators even the educators here are worried about the cost of allowing students into universities and hiring people with disabilities. Because of low budgets, what can you tell them? about allowing us to exist and not worry about a 
about the monetary constraints? That's a really good question. Most disabilities require accommodations that are minimal in cost. I think the average accommodation is less than $500. Then there are people with disabilities like me whose technology is more expensive and interpreters are expensive. Harvard spent a lot of money on interpreters and accommodations throughout my three years at the university. And I can tell you, they're very proud of it. And they feel that the experience was absolutely worth it. Students have all kinds of abilities and talents. And even students with disabilities who have accommodations that are expensive add extensive value, add just as much value back into the community and university. So the first part of the answer is, most students are not requiring expensive accommodations. A lot of accommodations are very easy. Don't make assumptions. First, take the time to figure out what exactly the student needs. And then, if your budget absolutely cannot allow an accommodation, find another solution that works. If I didn't have access to this, I'd, if I didn't have access to a Braille computer, I could try other ways of communicating, from sign language to print on palm, writing letters on palms. There are lots of different solutions. People create solutions based on the tools and abilities they do have. That's inclusion. Thank you, Hugo. And that was our last question. I want to encourage everyone to keep asking questions about ableism and costs and find out what you can do in your community to make it more accessible and inclusive. I'm going to be around for the next half hour to meet with people and ask questions. Thank you, everyone.